You're listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B. L. Purdom. Episode 40, The Tarot Hallows. Last time, I examined the cards in the Tarot Major Arcana, whose symbolism can help to illuminate J.K. Rowling's narrative choices in Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, so if you missed episode 39, you should go back. This time, I'll look at the cards aligned with the seventh book in the series, so you may wish to refer to the earlier episodes about Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, episodes 8 and 9 about the ruling mythic archetype for Deathly Hallows, and episodes 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29, which focus on games, toys, sweets, and fairy tales in the seventh book of the series. Anytime you want to listen or re-listen to any episode, just go to the Quantum Harry Twitter page, at QH Podcast, and click on the link in the pinned tweet to go to the Quantum Harry episode guide, which has links to all of the episodes in audio and video formats. There are also images of the tarot cards on the Quantum Harry blog, my Instagram account, the Quantum Harry Pinterest board, and the Quantum Harry Facebook group. And when the video version of this episode is posted on YouTube, you'll be able to see all of the images I'm talking about in the video. Harry embodies many archetypes. Fool, Emperor, High Priest, Youth, Lover, Justice, Hermit, Strength, Hanged Man, and all of the column cards for the seventh book the chariot, temperance, and the world. The chariot is of utmost importance here and concerns Harry being different from his family, embodying the metaphorically queer liminal being who chooses a new family and a new home. The chariot card displays symbols linked to a combination of opposing forces. It's also about going home, but it's a home of Harry's choosing, Hogwarts. He's not the only one to call it home. It's also Voldemort's chosen home, and thus a house divided. In the grid of 21 tarot major arcana cards that I've focused on since episode 30, with three rows and seven columns, the seventh column, the one aligned with Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, has the chariot, number seven, at the top, temperance, number 14, in the middle, and the world, number 21, at the bottom. In the first book, the Magician, number one, was the top column card and first sequential card, as I talked about in episodes 31 and 32. In the fourth book, the column and sequential cards intersect at force or strength, number 11, forming a cross, as I talked about in episode 37. There's a final intersection. The sequential cards for this book, the last set of three as we've worked our way through the cards numbered 1 to 21, are the Sun, number 19, Judgment, number 20, and the World, number 21. All roads lead to the World card in this book, symbolizing wholeness, completion, and home. The Chariot card ruling this book sheds new light on the seemingly endless travel in Deathly Hallows. It shows a figure who might be a prince, king, or magician, using a wand, not reins, to drive a chariot with dark and light draft animals, sometimes shown as a black sphinx and a white one, but often as a red horse and a blue horse. In addition to representing the opposing forces shaping Harry, making him liminal, these horses can stand for Ron and Hermione, Harry's best friends, who are opposites in some ways, but learn to pull together. He couldn't make the journey without them, and when Ron is away, he and Hermione are nearly killed in Godric's Hollow. Red also happens to be Ron's emblematic color, and blue is Hermione's, while Harry's is green, like his eyes, and the killing curse that repeatedly fails to kill him, as I talked about in Episode 7. The light and dark horses can also symbolize Harry's journey to wholeness. He cannot achieve this by ignoring his dark side, if you will, the Voldemort in him. He carries a piece of his enemy, and his understanding Voldemort helps him to succeed, even as it sometimes frightens Ron and Hermione. The chariot is another archetype Harry embodies, a union of opposites, a tarot version of the liminal being, as well as pointing to the extreme level of travel in the seventh book. 
but in addition to symbolizing the archetypal liminal being and travel, the chariot may also be a link to Voldemort's horcruxes. The word horcrux was coined by J.K. Rowling and could have multiple origins. One possible etymology combines H-O-R-S, a French root meaning out of or outside of, with crux, C-R-U-X, meaning essence, as in the crux of the matter. This gives us an object holding part of one's essence, or soul, outside of the body. The H-O-R part of horcrux is also similar to the hora, H-O-R-A, a circle dance in Israel and Romania, which may relate to hor, H-O-R, also being the Latin root for our, H-O-U-R, which gives us another circular connotation, a clock face. Crux also means cross in Latin, and when you combine a circle and cross, you get a symbol that looks like a wheel with four spokes, like the logo for this podcast. This circle with a cross, a circle divided into four quadrants, happens to be a long-standing symbol of the earth, since it suggests a compass and the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. It's also the modern symbol used for Earth by astronomers, including NASA, though the cross is now said to represent the equator and a meridian. It is also the shape of an ancient race game that evolved into Pachisi, Parchisi, and Ludo, among others, which share the goal of reaching the center of the cross within the circle, which is called home, as I talked about in episode 18. This symbol is also reminiscent of medieval labyrinths, like the cross and circle design of the one in Chartres Cathedral, which I also talked about in episode 18. Earth is the element out of the four that alchemists recognized, fire, air, water, and earth, that's linked to Voldemort, since his birth sign is Capricorn, an earth sign. Earth is also the element of the devil archetype, which Voldemort embodies, And in turn, Capricorn is the astrological sign linked to the devil card in the Tarot Major Arcana, which depicts a very goat-like devil. And Capricorn simply means horned like a goat. However, in another combination of opposites, the circle with an embedded cross was also called a sun cross, solar cross, or solar wheel. It is linked to prehistoric cultures, particularly the Neolithic to the Bronze Age periods in Europe. Thus, a wheel with four spokes can also be linked to the Sun card, and therefore to death and resurrection and the Phoenix. Voldemort's wand, until almost the end of his life, contains a feather from a phoenix, and the purpose of his making horcruxes was to make him like a phoenix, one who cannot die. For a symbol that could mean horcrux, a circle with a cross, to be equated with the sun also fits with the locket horcrux being a symbolic sun, like the golden ball in the grim fairy tale of the Frog King, as I talked about in episode 28. The locket also happens to be the horcrux aligning with the fifth book, Order of the Phoenix, the book aligned with the fifth column of Tarot Major Arcana cards, which has the sun card at the bottom as I talked about in episode 38. Finally, this symbol is also called a chariot wheel because of the sun god's chariot linking heaven and earth in the myths of many ancient cultures, connecting this both to the ruling column card for the book, the chariot, and its first sequential card, the sun. So two possible etymologies for horcrux may both be something ruling intended a word meaning that a person's essence is elsewhere, outside of their body, and a word combining circle and cross, pointing to the earth, a chariot wheel, and to the sun, which in turn is linked to the phoenix, once a source of Voldemort's power, and an entity he wishes to emulate by being impervious to death. The card linked to the chariot, number 7, is the tower, number 16, since 1 plus 6 equals 7. In Deathly Hallows, the lightning-struck tower, the title of the Half-Blood Prince chapter in which Dumbledore dies, is least symbolic of all. Hogwarts is under attack. Giants are literally tearing down the walls. It is a cataclysm, a violent rupture in the fabric of wizarding reality. 
However, we can see the Tower card as both upright and inverted here, since Hermione and Ron visit the Chamber of Secrets, the inverted tower of the second book, to retrieve basilisk fangs. Below the chariot is Temperance, number 14, a sequence card for the fifth book. The back and forth of the liquid between the vessels shows the mixing of water and wine. Watering wine tempers it, makes it less potent, and wine makes water more potent. It's another union of opposites, just as the chariot's dark and light draft animals are a union of opposites, and as such, it's also about balance. Voldemort, in contrast, would eject all muggle-born witches and wizards from the wizarding world, seeing no value in diversity. He's clearly incomplete because he has repeatedly ripped his soul to make horcruxes, but he's also incomplete because he rejects both the muggle part of himself and his link to Harry. As a result, he can no longer send even misleading messages to Harry's mind because he recoiled in horror when he was exposed to Harry's overwhelming power to love. This ability to bridge worlds, to be an axis mundi, is the power Harry has that Voldemort does not, and it's well summed up by the word love. Luna is again the angel temperance, an archetypal crone, when she helps Harry to cope with Dobby's death at Shell Cottage. But he also embodies the angel temperance in Deathly Hallows. The third eye on this card links to his being able to see through Voldemort's eyes, an ability he integrates into his skill set. Harry's being a pope or high priest, card number five, is also linked to the temperance card, number 14, since one plus four equals five. He's always been a holy man, ever since he was a bishop in the first book's life-sized chess game. Here he transcends worlds by seeing through the eyes of the other, Voldemort, and by dying and returning to life, serving as an intercessor for the entire wizarding world. As master of death, he understands the circle of life, instinctively summoning the shades of his parents, godfather, and Remus Lupin with the resurrection stone, presenting himself to die because it is necessary to save his world, to protect those he loves and those he doesn't. If a hero dies only for people he loves, he's hardly a hero, but Harry's love protects everyone. Harry, high priest, liminal charioteer, and angel temperance, refuses to run, as Aberforth suggests. The master of death transcends life and death and bestows his grace on all. Skipping over the world card for now, the bottom column card and last sequential card, let's look at the first sequential card, the sun, number 19, symbolizing another integration of opposites, of life and death, since the sun daily dies and is reborn. So, as I've mentioned before, this card is also linked to the dying and reborn phoenix. Harry dies and is resurrected in the seventh book, and a doppelganger for him, Neville, evokes the twin children seen on some versions of this card. Neville could have been the prophecy boy, and after Harry returns from death, he echoes Harry's actions in the second book by stating his faith in Dumbledore as Harry did, this time with a stirring cry of Dumbledore's army! Instead of Fox bringing the sorting hat, Voldemort summons the hat, which he wishes to destroy because he only plans for there to be Slytherins at Hogwarts in the future. He puts the hat on Neville and sets it on fire, a substitute for Fox, who was the symbolic fire of the Holy Spirit on Harry's head in the chamber, evoking the story of Pentecost, as I talked about in episode 13. The hat is described as looking like a misshapen bird, again evoking Fox, a phoenix representing the Holy Spirit in the Chamber of Secrets, instead of a dove, another bird symbolizing the Holy Spirit, who appears when John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. After this symbolic confirmation, Neville's coming-of-age ceremony, he breaks free of the curse binding him and slays Nagini, whose head spins high into the air, imagery suggesting again a similarity to a ball, like a snitch. The cards linked to the sun, number 19, are the magician, number 1, and the wheel, number 10. Throughout this book, the influence of the archetypal magician, Dumbledore, is keenly felt. 
His backstory's extremes are given before the truth. First, Rita Skeeter gets her say in a vitriolic biography. Then, Elpheus Doge gives his version. The truth is worse than Doge's hymn of praise, and not as bad as Rita's smear job. Harry finally gets a complete picture of the man in whose footsteps he has walked on the path to death from his brother, Aberforth Dumbledore. The archetypal magician dogs Harry's footsteps from the beginning of the book, when he reads excerpts from Rita's biography, and the magician is with Harry at the end, at King's Cross, which could be another circle and cross reference. A sovereign's orb in Latin is a globus cruciger, part of the collection of the British crown jewels. A globe symbolizes the earth, a three-dimensional circle, and the orb is topped by a cross, another union of circle and cross, on an orb that could be called a king's cross. This is an alternative earth sign to the circle with the cross inside it. Both are called earth symbols. In addition to this, the lore surrounding King's Cross may offer clues as to why J.K. Rowling sent Harry there after his death. The area where the King's Cross St. Pancras Station sits today was possibly the site of a crossing for the Fleet River in Roman times, outside of the Roman settlement of Londinium. In Christian lore, dying is frequently spoken of as crossing the River Jordan. This area may also have been the site of a battle between Queen Boudicca and Roman invaders. Legend has it that she's buried beneath Platform 9 in King's Cross Station, rather close to Platform 9 and 3 quarters. However, the name King's Cross didn't arrive until the 19th century, when a statue of King George IV was erected at the Battle Bridge Crossroads. In folklore, crossroads have always been places where the fabric of reality is thinnest, where travelers may meet supernatural spirits and have paranormal experiences. It is considered to be a place of liminality. In Greek mythology, crossroads were associated with Hecate and Hermes, who were both psychopomps, entities who accompanied spirits to the realm of the dead. Food was often left for Hecate at crossroads during the new moon, one of her titles was Goddess of the Crossroads, and she was considered a goddess of witches and magic as well. Combining this intersection of roads with the statue of the king gave it the name King's Cross, which persisted even after the statue was pulled down. The Wheel of Fortune card, also resembling a cross in a circle, describes Harry's horcrux hunt as much as a chariot, and the link to the sun can also evoke the phrase Chariot of Fire from Jerusalem, a hymn known to virtually every child growing up in Britain. does not cease from mental fight, unafraid of the link with the other, with embracing his third eye. Gryffindor's sword does not sleep in Harry's, Ron's, or Neville's hands. In addition to this, medieval labyrinths, whose shape again echoes the circle with a cross seen in Chart Cathedral and elsewhere, were called a path to Jerusalem, because walking the maze was treated as a substitute for going on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. 
The goal of the labyrinth, its center, therefore equals Jerusalem, which is home in this circle and cross game. And just as crossing the River Jordan is an expression used by Christians for death, so is going home. In many places, a funeral service is called a going home service. Rowling uses abundant Christian symbolism in the books, which is familiar to her, but Harry's symbolic bar mitzvah also happens at exactly the right age for him in the second book, and Hogwarts is a symbolic Jerusalem throughout the seventh. It is the goal of Harry's labyrinthine journey. Each year during Passover, Jews living in the diaspora often sing a phrase in the Haggadah that translates as, next year in Jerusalem. In other words, next year we will be home. A parallel between Jerusalem and Hogwarts as symbolic and literal home can be seen in reference to both Dumbledore and Snape at the beginning of Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept as we remembered Zion. We had hung up our lyres on the willows that were there, when those who had taken us captive asked us to sing them a song. Our tormentors demanded joy from us. Sing us one of the songs from Zion. How can we sing a song about the Lord here on foreign soil? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand wither away. May my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I fail to remember you, if I fail to count Jerusalem the greatest of all my joys. When he places the Deathly Hallows above his Jerusalem, Hogwarts, Dumbledore puts on the cursed ring and his right hand does wither. When Moody devises a punishment for Snape forgetting, he thinks, about his duty to Dumbledore and Hogwarts, which is to say, his Jerusalem, the spell at Grimmauld Place makes a person's tongue stick to the roof of their mouth. During what would have been Harry's seventh year at Hogwarts, his Jerusalem, he wanders in a strange land, longing for home, while those at Hogwarts might as well be in Babylon. The students are captives, forced to perform for Death Eaters, and Harry and Voldemort have both been playing an elaborate circle and cross race game throughout the book, both pursuing the same goal, the same home. All of this is evoked through the combination of the wheel, sun, and chariot cards. The second sequential card, Judgment, number 20, connects to Harry, Ron, and Hermione determining the next steps in their journey, especially Harry sacrificing himself, but also Harry summoning the shades of Lily, James, Sirius, and Remus, who rise from the dead, metaphorically, like the bodies on the card. More importantly, Harry returns to the world to help others. He is also resurrected, confirming his role of a holy man, like the Buddha who must choose either enlightenment for himself or returning to the world to help others. The High Priestess, number 2, and Strength, number 11, are again linked to Judgment, number 20. Ginny is once more the archetypal High Priestess, and her strength is also Harry's. The counter trio I talked about in Episode 7, Ginny, Neville, and Luna try to steal Gryffindor's sword from the head's office, now Snape's domain. With Hermione and Luna, a maiden mother crone triad, Ginny fights Bellatrix, and Harry pictures Ginny's face before he walks to his death. On the world card, number 21, the destination for the seventh column and the last sequential card, there are many symbols of wholeness and completion. The wreath around the central figure is like a snake eating its own tail, an Ouroboros. In each of the corners are also the symbols of the evangelists, seen on the wheel card as well. There's a man for Matthew, who aligns with Slytherin, a bull for Luke, who aligns with Hufflepuff, an eagle for John, who aligns with Ravenclaw, and a lion for Mark, who aligns with Gryffindor. All four houses unite against Voldemort, since Slughorn returns to the castle with the people of Hogsmeade as reinforcements. 
Snape is also still loyal to Dumbledore, Dumbledore's man through and through to the end. Harry walks into the forest with a group of four. This echoes other groups throughout the series. In the first book, Dumbledore, Hagrid, and McGonagall are with him on Privet Drive, the archetypal wise old man, mother, and father with the youth, Harry, who's also a liminal being. Later, Harry crosses the lake and encounters Fluffy with Ron, Hermione, and Neville, another archetypal wise old man, mother, and father. In the second book, Harry goes down to the chamber with Lockhart and Ron due to advice from Hermione, who's petrified in the hospital wing. Ron is still the wise old man and Hermione the mother, but Lockhart takes Neville's place as an archetypal father. He even ends up losing his memory and comes to live in the same hospital ward as Frank Longbottom, Neville's dad. In the fourth book, Harry is part of another group of four, the tournament champions, each representing a Hogwarts house. Cedric is a father and Victor a wise old man, and though Fleur is an archetypal maiden, in the epilogue of the seventh book, we learn that she has become a literal mother to Victoire. In the fifth and sixth books, the trio is doubled by the counter trio. The female characters converge into one epitome of woman, while the wise old man, Ron, father, Neville, and youth, Harry, again play their parts. When Harry returns to the forest, he is with a group reflecting the earlier quartets. Sirius, the godfather slash wise old man, James, the father, Lily, his mother, and Remus doubles Harry, since he's also a youth slash liminal being, as well as being father to Teddy, Harry's godson. Harry is positioned to take Remus's place in Teddy's life, and thus here they are equals, embodying the same archetypes, one dead and one soon to be dead and resurrected. The figure on the world card has two wands, and Harry is master of two wands, the Elder Wand, also seen on the Magician card, an archetype embodied by Dumbledore, plus Draco's Wand. The Elder Wand is returned to Dumbledore's tomb after the Battle of Hogwarts, but Harry is still its master. The Empress, number three, and the Hanged Man, number twelve, are again linked to the world, number twenty-one, since they all add up to three. Hermione is again the Empress and Harry the Hanged Man, roles they've played before, especially in the fifth book, when Harry was upside down with respect to the wizarding establishment and Hermione enabled his rebellion. He's even more on the outs with the Ministry in this book, a wanted man after Voldemort appoints a puppet minister. No longer just a laughingstock, Harry is undesirable number one, and his image is everywhere, like Sirius, who was also innocent in the third book. Hermione, the Empress, is a very organized rebel, packing a magical bag with whatever they need. She picks most of their destinations and is often the one who apparates them to a new place. She's like a chess queen version of an Empress, the most mobile piece on a chessboard, and accomplishes a great deal. As in the chess game in the first book, Harry, the bishop, the holy man and high priest, has the moves to win, but by sacrificing himself this time, not Ron as the knight. He had an example of what was necessary to win in the first book, when his best friend risked his life. Now he takes that lesson to heart and lays down his arms to win it all. Harry, accidental horcrux and master of death, dies to make Voldemort vulnerable, which links to Harry's trek to wholeness. He grasps the interconnectedness of life and death, while Voldemort tries to cut himself off from death. In the sixth book, Fudge says to the Prime Minister, Is a man alive if he can't be killed? The answer is arguably no. This, more than a splintered soul, makes Voldemort an incomplete entity who flees from wholeness, from both death and life, which includes being vulnerable to its end and valuing its beginning, childhood. The column cards for this book are full of wholeness and balance. The chariot's draft animals, whether horses or sphinxes, are dark and light. Temperance mixes water and wine and the world card carries symbols of wholeness and completion. 
Harry isn't enrolled at Hogwarts during the seventh book, but still has a confrontation with the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher, Amicus Caro. Though technically Defense has been dropped from his title, he's just the Dark Arts professor now. Neville tells Harry that Caro makes students torture each other. Harry's already seen him try to torture Ginny in the battle at the end of Half-Blood Prince, when she's protected by the lucky potion that Harry had her, Ron, and Hermione take. He turns Cruciatus back on Caro, the only time Harry succeeds at it. He failed to curse both Bellatrix and Snape with Cruciatus, even though at the time he was fueled by rage and grief over the murders of Sirius and Dumbledore. Harry is with Luna Lovegood, who always embodies the Angel Temperance, when he meets Caro in the Ravenclaw common room. Temperance is about balance and is at the opposite end of the Realm of Equilibrium, the second row of Tarot Major Arcana cards, from the Justice card, number 8, depicting the scales of justice, which are also about balance. This is why Harry is able to put Cruciatus on Caro, the curse he abused, a punishment that fits his crime, delivered by Harry who is also embodying Temperance here, an avenging angel, sharing his power with the students and Professor McGonagall by briefly torturing the torturer. It doesn't seem to be a typical Cruciatus curse. This effect hasn't been seen before in the books. Rowling writes, As Amicus spun around, Harry shouted, Crucio! The Death Eater was lifted off his feet. He writhed through the air like a drowning man, thrashing and howling in pain, and then, with a crunch and a shattering of glass, he smashed into the front of a bookcase and crumpled insensible to the floor. Caro is howling in pain and, soon after, collides with a glass-doored bookcase. Once he falls, he no longer seems to be under the spell. Harry could maintain the necessary level of righteous fury only for a short time. But it was the most appropriate curse for Caro to experience, and it was appropriate for Harry, sharing power with the powerless, to deliver this comeuppance to an abuser of power. If Hogwarts is Jerusalem, the Ravenclaw common room could be considered the temple where Jesus turned out the money changers, enraging the priest Caiaphas, who also abused his office as Caro abused his. Soon afterward, Jesus is arrested and killed. The scene in Ravenclaw's common room leads in short order to Harry's death, so this links the seventh book's horcrux, Harry himself, to the DADA teacher, and lets Rowling include even more Christian symbolism. J.K. Rowling begins the first Harry Potter book during All Hallowtide, which is three days long. Halloween, the Vigil of All Saints or All Hallows, the 31st of October, also called Samhain in pre-Christian times, when the veil between the living and dead is said to be thinnest, All Saints Day slash All Hallows, the 1st of November, and the 2nd of November, All Souls Day, when deceased relatives are remembered. Though most of the books take Harry close to the end of the Hogwarts school year, around mid-June or late June, Rowling places the Battle of Hogwarts exactly six months from All Souls Day, so we can consider it to be the flip side of All Souls, the 2nd of May, the day after May Day, a festival dating back to Roman times that was considered the start of summer. She begins the story at a time of three hallows linked to death, and she ends it during a celebration of life. These three hallows in All Hallowtide, Halloween, All Saints, and All Souls, are also linked to the tale of the three brothers. Hermione assumes that the story, which is about the Deathly Hallows, is fiction. Like Hermione, Ron discounts the tale. He grew up hearing it repeatedly and assumes that it's just a story. Harry, Ron, and Hermione are each drawn to a different hallow, and specifically to the hallow that aligns with the item Dumbledore left each of them in his will, minus the sword. In Chapter 21 of Deathly Hallows, Hermione tells Ron, I think you're right. It's just a morality tale. It's obvious which gift is best, which one you choose. The three of them spoke at the same time. Hermione said, the cloak. Ron said, the wand. And Harry said, the stone. 
Ron responds, you're supposed to say the cloak, as if this makes it too obvious a choice, and also says, you wouldn't need to be invisible if you had the wand. In the first book, when Harry realizes that Dumbledore has been watching him use the mirror of Erised, Dumbledore says, I don't need a cloak to become invisible. By the seventh book, it's clear that he was using the Elder Wand for a disillusionment charm. Ron's probably right about Beetle the Bard suggesting that the right item to choose is the cloak. This ties the hallow of the cloak to the story, and therefore to the book of fairy tales Dumbledore left Hermione, which is why it's fitting that her choice of hallow is the cloak, just as Ron specifically mentioning using the wand to be invisible, which we know Dumbledore did, makes this an appropriate choice for him. And of course, Harry's bequest, the snitch, contains his choice of hallow the Resurrection Stone. Hermione speculated that Beetle the Bard was inspired by the Philosopher's Stone to create the Resurrection Stone, two sides of one coin, since one protects from death and the other brings someone back from death. I think Rowling did want readers to compare the Hallows to things in the chamber with the Philosopher's Stone, but Hermione's theory was a red herring. There are three items in the chamber with the stone that are analogous to the Hallows, but the Resurrection Stone doesn't equal the Philosopher's Stone just because they're both stones. The last three sequential cards in the Tarot Major Arcana, 19, 20, and 21, also each align with an item in the chamber with the stone, and thus also align with the Deathly Hallows. The sun, number 19, linked to death and resurrection and phoenixes, aligns with the invisibility cloak, death's own cloak. Harry's protection from Lily is also equal to the hallow of the cloak. Voldemort co-opts this cloak of protection by taking Harry's blood in Goblet of Fire, not realizing that he's tethering Harry to life, creating something like a horcrux for him, Harry's blood in his enemy. He thinks Harry no longer has the blood protection, but he has better protection now, and wouldn't be able to return to life without it. This is why Dumbledore has that gleam of triumph at the end of Goblet of Fire. He's dreading telling Harry that he's an accidental horcrux, but now he has hope that Harry can return to life, even after being killed to destroy the Voldemort soul bit in him. Like the brother who gives his cloak to his son when he dies, when Voldemort kills Lily with his phoenix feather core wand, she passes a protection against death to Harry. It works. Voldemort, the incarnation of death, like the character in the tale, cannot kill Harry, and he rises from Lily's ashes like a phoenix, seen on many incarnations of the sun card, to become the boy who lived. Judgment, number 20, shows bodies rising from their graves on Judgment Day, and thus equals the Resurrection Stone, which is in turn the equal of the Mirror of Erised in the first book, as Lily's protection in Harry's very skin is equal to the Hallow of the Cloak. The Mirror would no doubt have shown the second brother his dead girlfriend, as it showed Harry his parents, because his heart's desire was someone who had died. Dumbledore said, Men have wasted away before it, entranced by what they have seen, or been driven mad, not knowing if what it shows is real or even possible. The second brother might have been just as suicidal from seeing his girlfriend in the mirror as he was when he used the Resurrection Stone, and Rowling has said that Albus Dumbledore sees his dead family in the mirror. When Harry is in the hospital wing after his ordeal with Voldemort and Quirrell, Dumbledore says, the trouble is, humans do have a knack of choosing precisely those things which are worst for them. He's referring to the Philosopher's Stone here, which provides, quote, as much money and life as you could want, but it can also apply to the stone's protection, the Mirror of Erised, and to the Deathly Hallows. The tale of the three brothers definitely depicts humans having a knack of choosing precisely those things which are worst for them. Having already made a grave error about the ring with the Resurrection Stone, Dumbledore engineers the snitch he bequeaths to Harry so that he can only use the stone at precisely the right moment as he walks to his death, summoning the shades of those he loves best. 
When they walk with him into the forest, it is like he is accompanied by the risen bodies on the judgment card, and later Harry also rises from the dead, becoming like the images on this card. Finally, the world, number 21, aligns with the hallow of the Elder Wand. The figure on the world card holds two wands, which we can see as the wand Harry wields in his last duel with Voldemort, the wand that was formerly Draco Malfoy's, and the Elder Wand, which he catches after it refuses to kill its master, Harry. The Elder Wand becoming entangled with Harry leads to Voldemort's defeat. It is a power that comes to him without his pursuing it, a power sought by Voldemort, like the Philosopher's Stone, the two items Voldemort pursues at each end of the series because he believes they will make him invulnerable to death, in addition to his horcruxes. Hermione is close when she suggests that the Philosopher's Stone is the flip side of a hallow, but it's this hallow, the Elder Wand, because the Philosopher's Stone gives life, while the Death Stick has a history of taking lives. Voldemort also tries to take the Philosopher's Stone from Dumbledore and is thwarted by Harry, who receives it from the mirror because he has no desire to use it. Later, Voldemort takes the Elder Wand from Dumbledore's grave, but is again thwarted by Harry. He physically possesses the wand, yet Harry is its master, and again, he has no interest in this power. The protection Harry receives from Lily, equal to the hallow of the cloak, defines Harry until he becomes the youngest seeker in a hundred years. That Rowling uses the title of seeker for the key position in Quidditch, the one position a team cannot do without and win the match, gives Quidditch distinct religious overtones due to the early 17th century English dissenters known as seekers. Their chief belief was that everyone should be open to direct revelation from God and not rely on an intermediary, a belief also common to Baptists and Quakers. Harry's Quidditch position is not just a sports role, but a metaphysical title pointing to his liminal nature as an axis mundi, a link between worlds. Youngest Seeker in a Hundred Years becomes a title linked to the Hallow of the Stone, which also transcends barriers between life and death, and is, quite appropriately, in the snitch Harry catches in his first match. When Harry becomes Master of the Elder Wand, he acquires a title linked to the Third Hallow, Master of Death. In the first book, the Hallows are represented by Lily's Love, the Mirror of Erised, and the Philosopher's Stone, converging when Harry sees Lily in the mirror, which gives him the stone. In the last book, the Hallows' equals are Dumbledore's bequests, which is why Hermione is attracted to the cloak, Harry to the Resurrection Stone, and Ron to the Elder Wand. The titles Harry receives in the first book, The Boy Who Lived and The Youngest Seeker in a Hundred Years, are joined by the title of Master of Death, each title also being linked to a hallow, and in turn, each is linked to one of the sequential cards for the seventh book. The Boy Who Lived is a phoenix rising from his mother Lily's ashes, like the phoenix often depicted on the sun card. Lily's love is like the hallow of the cloak, which they learn about through Hermione's Bequest, a book of fairy tales. The youngest seeker in a hundred years is entangled with Snitches, Harry's Bequest, which gives him the equal of the Mirror of Erised, the Hallow of the Resurrection Stone, all of which are linked to the Judgment Card. And becoming master of the equal of the Philosopher's Stone, the Hallow of the Elder Wand, which Dumbledore took from his beloved friend, after possibly locating him with Ron's bequest, the Deluminator, as I talked about in episode 27, makes Harry master of the Elder Wand, holding two wands like the image on the world card, and therefore Harry is also master of death. Rowling takes readers on a tour de force journey through the major arcana, playing a game of cross-references and symbols, three hallows and rows, seven horcruxes and columns, bringing Harry to an end that is a beginning to the rest of his life, giving the world a complete liminal hero, embracing life, death, and all the games in between, seen in the archetypes on the cards whose images emerge time and again in the seven books. The Death card has no link to the seventh book. Death doesn't conquer Harry. It has no dominion over one who doesn't fear it. 
Death doesn't appear in this book's column, sequence, or numerically linked cards. Characters die, but death still doesn't win. Harry wins by refusing to play so that everyone else wins. Harry is master of the world and of death, renouncing ownership of the Deathly Hallows after he masters that game, except for Death's Cloak, which is his until he removes it metaphorically at his life's final end, having caught the golden snitch and being ready to leave the Quidditch pitch, facing Death willingly and embracing him as an old friend. <laughs> This last part of the last episode of Quantum Harry the Podcast is an epilogue of sorts. What J.K. Rowling did with her epilogue again shows the archetypal roles she finds most important in relation to Harry. It may or may not have been intentional that Rowling gave Harry exactly the same configuration of children as the Norse god Thor, two sons and a daughter. Rowling firmly placed Harry in the role of Thor in the second book, when he was pierced by the basilisk's fang as he killed it. His scar also links him to Thor, and marks him as a human sword, the human incarnation of the Sword of Gryffindor, the vehicle of the basilisk's death. As the human Sword of Gryffindor, Harry is both the Gryffindor Horcrux and a destroyer of Horcruxes. A significant non-parallel with Thor is that he died from the serpent's venom, while Harry is healed by phoenix tears from Fox, the avatar of Dumbledore, the god figure. It's also fitting that Dumbledore, playing the role of the god Odin in Half-Blood Prince, who's swallowed by a huge wolf called Fenrir, perishes by Snape's hand, a symbolic serpent, as a Slytherin, while the werewolf Fenrir Greyback is in the castle and offering to kill Dumbledore in Draco's place, as I talked about in the previous episode. But even if it's a coincidence, and with the parallels between Harry and Thor that seems unlikely, that he has two sons and a daughter, their names again evoke the archetypes of the father, James, mother, Lily, and wise old man, Albus, who accompany Harry at important times in his life. Albus's middle name, Severus, also evokes a crone, as does Lily's middle name, Luna, and James's middle name evokes another wise old man, Sirius. Harry and Ginny are their literal father and mother, but they will also always be, archetypally, a youth and a maiden. Thus, their family encompasses all six gender and age archetypes. Maiden, Ginny, Mother, Lily, Crone, the middle names Luna and Severus, Wise Old Man, Albus and the middle name Sirius, Father, James, and Youth, Harry. In addition to Harry, Ginny, and their children embodying these archetypes, Teddy Lupin, son of Tonks and Remus, is a youth to whom Harry is the wise old man, godfather variety, and he's seeing Victoire Weasley, another maiden and child of a maiden-slash-youth couple, Fleur and Bill Weasley. Symbolically, Teddy and Victoire are the epitome of new life, carrying on the maiden-slash-youth tradition of their parents, plus Harry and Ginny. In spite of his names coming from an archetypal wise old man and a crone, Albus Severus is clearly Harry all over again. Like Harry, he is concerned about what his sorting might mean about his character deep down if he becomes a Slytherin, since there's still a strong distrust of Slytherins in the wizarding world, and we see the fallout from this in the play Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. In the Deathly Hallows epilogue, Harry's and Albus's roles are reversed. The one named for the former headmaster is reassured by Harry, as he once was by Dumbledore, that it's our choices that show who we really are. Harry also reminds his son that his middle name comes from a great Slytherin and the bravest man Harry ever knew. It's a touching moment between father and son and serves as a passing of the torch to the next generation. In his name alone, Albus Severus encompasses opposites that point to his embodying another archetype, like his father, Harry. 
the liminal being, the seventh archetype, the usual one for a story's protagonist, and specifically the key archetype for Harry, the protagonist of Rowling's tarot story. Rowling herself voiced an interest in the future of Albus Severus Potter well before the stage play existed, and it should have shocked no one that he was sorted into Slytherin in the play. She did give him the initials ASP. Thus, the epilogue is about new life and new possibilities, but also continuity. Life is always circular, the eternal round, a trip of completion and wholeness, though it ends in death, which is as important as birth to the cycle. Others rise from the ashes of the dead as virtual phoenixes, new life in all its complexity, waiting to reenact the cyclical journey to learn the same lessons and reap the same rewards. There's always another Harry being born somewhere, and we all look forward to the resulting journey of discovery, and are luckiest if on that journey, what we ultimately find is ourselves. You've been listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast. The Quantum Harry theme music is composed, arranged, and performed by B.O. Purdom. Additional music in this episode includes the traditional English hymn Jerusalem by Charles Hubert Hastings Parry, 1848 to 1918. Words by the poet William Blake, 1757 to 1827. The music accompanying the reading from Psalm 137 is By the Waters of Babylon by English composer Philip Hayes, 1737 to 1797. Both pieces are in the public domain and both are performed by B. L. Purdom. Remastered combined podcast episodes, starting with episodes 1, 2, and 3, all in one file, will go live when Quantum Harry Volume 1, Mythic Archetypes in Harry Potter, is published by 226 Press later this year. And more remastered episodes will go live when Volumes 2 and 3 are released, as well as the single volume edition of the complete Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse. Information about purchasing the books will be included in the remastered episodes, as well as in the Quantum Harry episode guide. The original versions of all episodes will continue to be available on CastBox and YouTube. No recordings of the music in this episode may be reused without permission from B.L. Purdom. what platform you use to listen to Quantum Harry, please leave a rating and a comment and share episodes of Quantum Harry with your friends. I hope you've enjoyed this trip through the Harry Potter books as much as I have. Thanks for listening.